Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea, and this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips that we all can do on a daily basis, which can lead us to finding our inner peace. I know that inner peace is possible. I've been without it. I've found ways to get it. And on this podcast, we talk about ways that we can find it and keep it on a daily basis. I would like to welcome everyone to another episode. And this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips that we can do on a daily basis that lead us to our inner peace. And I'm pleased to be joined today with our guest, Jesse Elder, and he does a lot of things in his life, and we'll have him uh, explain a lot of that. But one of the reasons we have uh, Jesse with us is to talk about how he approaches making the world a better place and what are some of the tips that he can have for all of us. So uh, thanks for joining us. Chris, it's my pleasure, man. Really looking forward to this. And you know, so it, I was looking at your stuff too before we we uh, came on here. And I just the the two words that you've used in your own practice, life's journey, uh, man. I there's so much depth there. And and we live in a culture which is rushing to get to the finish line. But you know, imagine if if you were to to sell a book saying life's finish line, everybody would think that it was about dying, you know, or death. So. I think it's life's journey, man. I, I just, I think that there's a deep wisdom there. Oh, and, and I appreciate that. And, and, uh, you know, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I don't think our journey necessarily ends, but yes, people would think if we were at the end, that was it. Right. And, uh, you, you know, I, uh, I, I've been tempted to put a blog post like that, but I don't want all the condolences or lack of condolences <laughs> and I feel even worse. So either way. Um, That's so funny. But yep. yeah, I mean, to me, it's, but it is, it is, it is all a journey. Yeah. journey. Yep, absolutely. And what's interesting, and and you know, I, I uh, I've been very fortunate to have lots of different mentors and and you know, coaches and martial arts instructors and everything. And and um, one thing that that always seemed to be a theme is that you know, uh, enjoying the journey doesn't mean settling and it doesn't mean that that you're just going to you know be content with what you've got now because you don't really have what you want so just chill out enjoy the journey all of my mentors lived and live fantastic lives like they're not in a hurry to get somewhere because he is so amazing and i've and that really rubbed off on me you know and i thought man if i if i can just enjoy fully where i'm at not in a um you know, I have to suffer with this right now, but literally like, no, man, I can, I can have whatever I want right now through my focus, through my intention, through perception, and literally bring into my reality, the things and the experiences and the people that I want to have. Uh, and if I can be that for other people, well, that can all happen right now. And, and that's been my, my focus for, for the last few decades. And so far it seems to be working out. And, and, I, and I love that philosophy, you know, because for me, it, it is all about the right now in the moment, what's happening. And if we can, you know, really center ourselves and appreciate the moment, yeah, change our, our lives and our journey so dramatically. Oh, dude, you're, you're speaking the, the gospel now, man. I, that is, that's literally the key. I mean, if, if people just went back and heard what you said, like, and just put that on loop a couple of times until it became embedded in their psyche. Yes. Everything is about appreciation. Whatever we appreciate, you know, whatever we give our positive attention to uh, appreciates it increases in value. Whatever we appreciate appreciates and literally displaces any sort of drama and negativity. And that's why I'm sure you see a lot in the, um, you know, what I sometimes tease as the impersonal development industry, 
You know, it's very kind of clinical and very strategy oriented. There's all this dry structure. Isn't all that supposed, stuff supposed to help people just feel better about themselves and be happy? Well, why don't we just get to that part? Instead, we got to, you know, lay on a couch and talk about, you know, horrible things for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours on end, which only makes you feel better when you stop. So why not just stop in the first place? Oh, and, and I totally agree. And, you know, for me, it's, it's looking at what are the positives. You know, we, we don't want to ignore the negatives in our lives, but why don't we start focusing more on the positives in our lives and, you know, operate in, in that way. And, and to me, that, that's a world of difference so that we're not just dwelling on what's negative and what's wrong and what, what am I fixing? Well, what's good? Yes, yes. And, and exactly right, because there's, there is equivalent positive and negative aspects to everything. I mean, even, even on the smallest level of, of scale, every, every subatomic particle has a positive and a negative charge. And so every situation is positive and negative. Every person has positive and negative qualities. And so I, I love what you just said there. It really is about focusing and accentuating the positive. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I got a, a tax, I say a couple of years ago is when I was first starting my, my business. I got a tax bill that was the equivalent of probably four months income. And because I hadn't been paying attention and just was teaching martial arts instead of actually running a business, uh, I had to pay that in like 10 days <laughs> or they're going to put, you know, like a lien on my house or something. And, uh, you know, I had a little, little gut check moment there. I was like, oh, how am I going to do it? And I thought, you know what? This is great. Because I would, this wouldn't have happened without my ability to also figure it out. And so I'm actually appreciative of this immovable object, a.k.a. a tax lien. So since I can't move that out of the way, why don't I just grow? And uh, I, I meditated. I got chill. I, I asked for, for guidance. I asked for resources. Next thing you know, I started to get ideas, felt a little bit better. And eight days later, I sent a check off to the IRS for the entire amount. Awesome. So, so a lot I'm of very it does have to that. do with, oh yeah, definitely. And, and it sounds like a lot does have to do with a positive attitude and taking action. Oh dude, th that's, that's like the two-sided coin of truth right there, man. <laughs> you nailed it, Chris. Positive attitude and taking action. How many people take action with a negative attitude? Most of them. <laughs> <laughs> or how many people have have a positive attitude and just feel really good, feel really good. And then they sit on their butt all day. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I reserved the website uh, lawoftraction.com. Not attraction, traction, like rubber meets the road, traction, lawoftraction.com. It's like, let's have the positive attitude, but let's also like, what are you going to do with it? You got to turn it into something. Love that, man. Yeah. It sounds like that's what you were able to do. And that's how you got through something that, that you could have griped about for ages, uh, but instead refocused yourself and took action on it and then was able to take care of it eventually. Yeah, exactly. Because it's like, you know, the situation is the situation and it's the drama that we put into it. Um, or especially if we try and, you know, sign a bunch of other people up in our drama and, and get their sympathy. We don't want sympathy. We want connection. Uh, but, but oftentimes we'll settle for sympathy because at least somebody's paying attention to us. And then they got to compete with their story about, well, let me tell you about the time that I had a shitty or a terrible thing happen. And so it's like, yeah, here's the fact. Let's not put any emotion into it. You know, what are we going to do? And, and I guess that is, is a central theme is that I, I just don't, I, I don't have any evidence in my life or in the life of any client or, or, or student that I've worked with. I don't see any evidence to suggest that we ever get problems that we can't handle. I see lots of evidence that we get problems uh, or puzzles that we don't know how to solve yet. But isn't that the game of life? Isn't that the fun of life? So let's just not have drama about it. Let's just figure it out. Exactly. And, and I'm with you right there on, you know, looking at what can we do with life? How do we learn from life? And mm -hmm. that to me is just the whole energy that can move us forward. You know, I mean, the more you want to sit in the negativity, the less you're going to have the energy to do anything. And, you know, yeah. I, I've been there. I mean, I've done that. I, I know what it's, it's, you know, feels like to just sit there yeah. and do the woe is me stuff. And, you know, you, you get nowhere with that. 
So yep. you might as well try the positive because you're not going to, you know, lose or get any worse. You know, it can only get better. That's right. That's right. And it's a trend. You know, you, there's no end to the negativity. It just keeps getting darker and worse and darker and worse and darker and worse. And there's no end to the light and there's no end to the to the expansion. And and I I'm, I'm curious your opinion on this. I, I don't know that the universe or God or, or I, I don't think that there's an inherent bias i think the universe is like you know dark and light it's all part of it's all part of the spectrum so you there little human you've got free will choice you can pick whatever you want we don't really care oh and, and i think that you know the free will of choice is the key you know that when you look at you know major uh world religions or even just you know movements where people are trying to find their peace in life it, it all revolves, uh, the way that I look at it, it all revolves around the ability to have choice and to make choice in my life. So free yes. will, I, I think, is, is key, you know, and what I talk to uh, my clients about, you know, when they're feeling stuck, and, and I get that feeling, but to remind them that, you know, you have choices right now, and maybe all the choices that you have aren't ones that you want, but you still have choices. So part of, you know, the, the pain you're sitting in, part of that is the choice you're making right now. I agree a thousand percent, Chris. A thousand percent. And the choice of, of the words that we're going to use, the choice of the thoughts we're going to think, you know, the choice of, you know, am I going to sit down and, and, you know, watch TV or am I going to get up and go for a walk around the block? Those are choices. There's nobody, nobody standing there with a gun to our head saying, don't you move off the couch or we're going to blow your brains out. You know, hopefully that's right. not the case. And if so, we're, we're choosing that. We're choosing whatever it is we're doing. A tremendous, tremendous power in that. Well, and even in that example, and, and I, I get the, you know, we, we use examples like that all the time. But, you know, when, when people say to me, yeah, but the choices aren't good ones, but you still have choice. You're not trapped, you know, so... Like when you say, well, if somebody's got a gun to your head and says, don't move or I'll shoot you, you, you still, still do have a choice. You still have a choice. You know, <laughs> one of true. them isn't the best, you know, and has a lot That's of risk right. involved. But don't That's take right. away the fact you still have a choice in life. You, you know, so yeah, they can say, well, realistically, I'm trapped. You know, well, yes, no. You know, so Love we always have a choice. That. It, it's just what is the risk, you know, the, the, that's involved there and. And I, I mean, obviously, I hope you don't have a gun to your head right now. But you know, you know, it, what's funny is that I, I uh, so for years I had a, a very successful chain of martial arts schools, and I uh, training one of our staff members and on his business because he's, he's a great instructor, hand to hand combat instructor, uh, but his his business wasn't doing well. He wasn't recruiting. He wasn't talking to people. And so I just told him, I said, look, man, here's the deal. If you want to earn more income, you've got to help more people. You've got to get out there. And so you've got a choice. You can go out and recruit or don't recruit. And I, and I used that metaphor with him. And I said, look, I mean, if somebody was standing there with a gun to your head saying, hey, you have to go out and schedule some community demonstrations, what would you do? And this guy looked at me deadpan. He said, well, Mr. Elder, I would just disarm him. I would take the gun away. <laughs> Like, yeah, wrong metaphor, wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what I love of that, that was a choice. 100%. 100%. So we aren't stuck. I love it. <laughs> so, so how, you know, all of this stuff, and, and I know this is all talking about making the world a better place, but how do you kind of uh, approach, you know, helping people to create this better place or, you know, finding peace and success and, you know, wh whatever it is yeah. that they're looking for. Uh, how do we do that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Chris. I, I and it's, it's been my focus uh, sort of selfishly because I was kind of trapped and stuck. You know, that was my perception. I didn't realize that I was choosing. Uh, and, and what I see people uh, suffering with quite often is a lot of division in their lives. They've got all these compartments of their life that are actually at war with one another. So they use a certain language and mindset and energy when they're at work and then a different mindset 
mindset and energy when they're with their spouse and then a different mindset and energy when they're with their kids and then a different mindset and energy when they're, you know, worshiping or practicing their spiritual faith or and then a different mindset and a different energy, you know, when they're, when they're studying politics or economics. And it's like, what if you just, how about live one life as you, the most authentic, powerful, your version of you and just be unapologetically, respectfully, responsibly dangerous to the status quo and start to live as an artist because art is the, the uh, upper reach of human and uh, human endeavor. Art is, is, uh, is uniquely human. And so uh, I, I help people and, and do the best I can to teach people how to make living as an artist practical and how to make that profitable. And I don't mean necessarily painting or composing music, unless that's their thing. Uh, but everybody's got an art that's inside of them um, that when they use logic as an app, not the OS, that we can actually tap into our hearts and the innate intelligence of our bodies and perhaps even access some sort of super conscious intelligence, call it intuition or, or uh, you know, guides or God or whatever word somebody prefers to use to describe the indescribable. When we tap into that art uh, and that artist and we stop starving our artist and we allow our artist to continue to come out and play, uh, I just have so much evidence uh, in, in my life, and I see this in clients and, and people all around the world, is that when somebody begins to live as an artist without apology, and when they do allow themselves to be respectfully and responsibly dangerous to the status quo, not in a predatory or antagonistic sort of way, but more in a uh, non-conformist, uh, yeah, that's not right for me, this is what's right for me, and people start doing that, uh, it has a tremendous liberating effect, uh, not only on them, but but I've, I've seen communities and organizations and, and businesses and families and schools changed with one person who decides to own their artist and um, stop hiding who they actually are and stop trying to prove to everybody uh, their, their worth and value. Nothing to hide, nothing to prove. It, it's so far seemed to be a, a productive parent. And, you know, I think when you look at that, that lends itself to a definition that I've used for, you know, what, what do I mean by inner peace? And that being when we are in sync with what we are doing with our thoughts and values and morals for ourselves. Beautiful. Beautiful. I agree 1000%. I mean, I guess that means I agree 10 times, but you know what I mean? I, I got you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so when you're, you know, looking at finding that, you know, like being that artist, you know, one, one of the conversations I, I've had often and actually just recently was our society's view of certain professions as uh, better than others, you know. So the uh, highly successful, meaning wealthy CEO is going to be valued and looked at by society more so than the painter you talk about or, you know, the local plumber, carpenter, or whatever. But in my mind, when you look at following your passion and success, they are equal. If, if your passion was to be a successful CEO and another passion is to be the best plumber that exists, and you both are doing it, then you both are successful at it. I guess my question is when we're looking, you know, at trying to make the world the, the better place, how do we get countercultural when the culture is so dead set on saying, yeah, you both might be successful, but that CEO still is a little bit above you just because you're an artist plumber, et cetera. Yep. Great. Great, great, great. And I, and I think this is actually part of the responsibly dangerous dialogue because the, the reason why the CEO or the, the entrepreneur or the venture capitalist, basically it all comes down to money and society is still in the sort of the last stages of this collective dream that we've been in that says money makes you more valuable, which is total BS. Um, money is a simple tool that has nothing to do with the intrinsic value of a human being. And so I think it comes down to, uh, in, in, in my opinion, comes down to someone separating their current money situation 
from their self-worth or their value as a human being. Or, or your value as a human being is in your frequency. It's in your feeling of your own emotions and the clean expressing of your own emotions uh, and, and trusting yourself to be somehow got in an expanded way. I mean, that's has nothing to do with money. And so when somebody owns that and can say, oh, cool, I have money, but I'm not my money, that's uh, a very useful way to begin to, to uh, unlock the actual value that that person has. And, and um, you know, I was, I was just talking to, to a client about this a couple of days ago that there, there's, I'm, I'm very appreciative to have people all over the world that have, have seen you know, my videos and, and, uh, and some stuff that I've done. And I've literally had conversations in one day with one man at a train station who was in between residences, AKA homeless uh, about these, some of these concepts. And then later that day I was having dinner with a friend of mine uh, here in Austin, who uh, runs a, the largest shipping logistics company in the world. He's very close to or, or at a, a billionaire level and talking about the exact same concepts. And it's just, it's amazing to me that every one of us only wants one thing, no matter how much money we have or freedom we don't have or whatever it is, every, every one of us only wants one thing and we just want to feel better no matter where we're at we want to feel better we want to feel like, like we have more or or we want to feel like we've got simplicity we, we want to be more loved or we want to have more privacy I mean, we always want more we just don't stand still so this uh this this separation of value uh and unhooking from the money game uh, actually allows people to win the money game a lot faster money money flows very quickly for someone who doesn't need it but who appreciates the choices that it can create and uh that's that's i, I routinely see clients double and triple and and sometimes quintuple their income in very short periods of time and sometimes less than than three or four weeks once they understand that money is just a resource not in energy. Money doesn't have any energy by itself. Take a dollar bill out of your pocket. Anybody listening to this can do this experiment. Take a dollar bill or a, you know, or a, a euro or, or Deutschmark or, or renminbi or you know, a penny. It doesn't matter. Take a piece of currency out of your pocket, put it on the table and sit there and look at it and wait for it to move. Right. <laughs> it won't move because it has no energy. Human beings have energy around money and that's worth looking at because if we've got fear or greed, that's actually a repulsive frequency. But if we're neutral on money and we focus on where money comes from, which is actually people, and we focus on serving people in a way that they need to be served, not the way we think they need to be served. You know, it's like the joke for marketing and sales. People say, when are people gonna buy my stuff? Well, man, the second you sell what they want, and if they're not buying, it means you're selling the wrong thing. Exactly. You know, and one of the things that really made me this, you know, double think. And it was like, oh, wow, you know, I, th this, this actually makes sense. I, I, I was listening to a TED talk and I, I really wish I could remember who the speaker was, but when they made, you know, the claim that what separates us as humans and uh, as a group of animals from other groups of animals, and it wasn't our ability to group into governments or group into societies and all that because they made the case a, a lot of different uh, animals do things like that but that it was our ability of imagination that differentiates mm. us yeah and absolutely the example that he was using was things like country borders you know I mean, when you think about it a, a country border is really just our imagination of this line that separates one group of people from another, but we kind of made that up. And what really got me thinking was when he brought up the money issue, because his take was money and the value of anything that we have, gold, silver, whatever it may be, that's all imaginary. That, that's all really just based on what we imagine something to be worth based on what we feel. And Agreed. You know, you really, it's all a game. Yeah. I mean, it, and, and it's a made up game, you know, it, it's, you know, based, uh, I guess off of, you know, well, I want something and you have it and, and there's not a lot of it. So it's more valuable to you and, you know, but in reality, there, there's no, you know, like 
law. There's no universal code, if you will, that, that dictates money. We made that up. We used our imagination. So we're basing a society in the way we view people and what they do based on an imaginary object. Yes. And it's not even that old. I mean, it only goes back about um, like 4,000 years to the Babylonians. Yeah. And, and even that was invented as a top-down system. It was invented by the, by the banks and the government to get everybody enrolled in this command and control sort of system, uh, which is not too good for the human spirit, as it turns out. <laughs> no, no, not at all. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's what makes me, you know, thinking when we talk about making this world a, a better place, and uh, I'm not necessarily saying we're going to ditch all money, but, you know, I think we have to keep that perspective that if we're going to base somebody's value or worth on something that we as humans created versus what we as humans actually have the innate capability of doing that's really messed up yeah yeah i i agree man and i and i i love that statement that i i think we won't get rid of money but i think money will develop all sorts of alternatives um, you know, and I'm not, uh, I'm sure some people listening to this will think, yeah, he's talking about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. <laughs> well, really, that's just digital money. Right. And so this, the concept is exactly the same. Exactly. It's right. just uh, digital instead of, you know, physical. So I'm not a fan of that. I like it's a cool tool. Um, and there are definitely people that are saying, oh, I made so much money. Well, you didn't make any money until you can take it out <laughs> and, and, and buy something with it. You haven't made anything. Um, but I'm, I'm much more a fan of human currency, uh, human energy, ingenuity, uh, intuition, inspiration, adaptability. I mean, these are the uniquely human currencies that we have uh, that I think are going to be around uh, long after Bitcoin and whatever else replaces that goes away. And, and I would totally agree. And, you know, that's where I'd love to see the shift in cultures and societies so that what we view as, you know, making world a better place and, you know, finding our own inner peace is when we can actually start, you know, looking at ourselves based off of what we uh, do and who we are versus the, this imaginary yes. system. Yes. So, yeah. The days that makes the, the change. It, the days... The day's coming, man. And, it, and it's coming because of conversations and dialogue like this. You know, for us to have this dialogue 50 years ago, we'd have been like, what are these two bearded guys talking about? But then I, the truth is now it's beginning to be a legitimate conversation. And there are communities popping up all over the place. And this is not like, you know, counterculture, you know, Birkenstock, commune, where everybody's wearing, you know, like old tires wrapped around their feet as shoes. I mean, you know, millennials aren't going to fall for that stuff. They're like, uh, no, I do want Wi-Fi and I do want comfortable clothes. Right. And so, you know, that's, we're not talking about going backwards materially. We're actually going forward materially. Uh, we're going to do so much faster and have so many other structures. You know, there, there are right now there, there are, I can think of at least three off the top of my head, communities that are thriving communities um they've got dozens and dozens of families they've they've hit dunbar's number you know 150 people which is a, a great number for humans it's not too many that people don't know each other but it's also not too few that you risk um you know gene pool right. pollution and so 100, 150 is a great number and there i can think of three communities that are completely self-sufficient they are operating on a um on a closed loop survival mechanism. And that sounds like alarmist, but it really just means that all their food, all their energy is produced from within their own um, immediate physical area, but they're on a very open source social network. And so that means that they're communicating and creating and, and exporting video and art and music and all this stuff with other communities all around the world. And I think that's what we're gonna see, a, a, uh, a return to this holacracy. Right, where we we can be self-sufficient in our communities, but we're not isolationists. 
Absolutely. And I think exactly. Then we have the best of all worlds. Uh, we, we eliminate this ridiculous long supply chain when it comes to resources. We eliminate this, this absolutely foolish in every way um, military expenditures for uh, fossil fuels, which are inefficient at best. And then all of a sudden, you know, all, the, all of that goes to just support these giant structures and corporations and governments. Uh, which which are just basically using population as fodder for this consumerism. And if you just eliminate the need for that and give people a better alternative, you know, given the choice between buying, you know, fuel that came from oil in some field that, you know, my neighbor's son had to go and die for, or, um, you know, paying my neighbor uh, who, who is uh, hooked up, a uh, you know recursive generator on treadmills that his family runs in, and a, a micro hydro uh, electro mill from the stream that he's running, and I'm going to go and pay him for clean green energy. Hmm, let me think about you know wh which yeah. energy source do I want and feel better about. Once people start having more and more options, they're going to do it. That's just what human beings do. And and I agree, and that brings us you know full circle of what we were saying at the beginning is we have options. You know, it's the matter, yes. I think, of looking outside of the box and finding what are all of these options that we have, because we're not yep. stuck with just one thing. No But way. it may mean a, a considerable change in what we're used to. And, and I think, dude, I'm, I'm so, I just called you dude. That was very unprofessional of me. <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> like, this, like, like, yeah. uh, discussions yeah, are like, like, overly like, professional. Like, <laughs> Like, like these two, like these two bearded guys care. <laughs> Please. <laughs> and so, so the, so I, I think with the alternatives, uh, what's going to happen is the alternatives are going to start to become sexy. The alternatives are going to start to be cool and they're going to be self-evident and people are going to naturally gravitate towards them and they're going to evolve faster than any, you know, local bureaucratic ability regulate. And people are just going to do it, and the and the bureaucracy is going to be forced to either shrink uh, or or support it. And what's very exciting is that people will begin to uh, shop jurisdictions the way that we shop for clothes right now. You know, you you wouldn't pay more for a pair of shoes than they were worth um, just because somebody said you had to buy them, and that's not how the how free market works. And pretty soon we'll be shopping for jurisdictions. You know, I'm not going to pay more. Uh, with my tax dollars, I'm not going to pay more for that than I'm getting in use value or to salve my conscience. And that's very exciting. Uh, jurisdictions and bureaucracies and governments will be forced to be competitive for the first time in history, not competing with each other, but competing for the actual resource of consumer attention. Exactly. And, you know, as a uh, very amateur history buff, you know, to me, that almost sounds like the beginning of the nation where the government had the very limited powers of really just the taxation and, and the protection of, of that nation. It was really up to your local towns when you got down to it to take care of the townspeople and do what they needed to do. And if there was a larger threat, well, the government would handle that, but anything else was pretty well regulated to your local community and, and furthermore to your local state. But really that, that community base. That's exactly it. 100%. It's the people don't need regulation. People don't need permission. Uh, and, and most of, you know, mo most, not all, but, but many laws, especially, um, you know, many, many civil right laws or even civic laws uh, are really just legalizing uh, your, your basic rights and then selling it back to you. You know, I mean, you, you, you don't really need a license to drive a car. Um, you know, you drive a car, your parents can teach you how to drive a car. Right. So the license isn't to make sure you know how to drive. The license is to now it's in Texas, a, a driver's license uh, in order for, uh, I just went to renew my license because I'm coming off of a year of uh, nomadic living. So I finally have a, a, a place again. So I've got to renew my license and I'm, I'm just reading through it and I'll be darned if in order to get a driver's license, you must also register for selective service. You have to sign up for the draft in order to get your driver's license. Yep. And I thought, man, recruitment, recruitment must be way down. All these kids are playing Halo. They don't want to actually go and do the real thing. <laughs> exactly. You know, 
Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it, it is all tied in, you know, and, and I really like what you're saying because the way that I see where our society has become uh, is really not sustainable. And I, I think especially when we look at things such as stressors and anxieties and, you know, why do we have this uptick in, in a lot of your mental health issues and uh, your yeah. addictions and all of that. But I, I think part of that is, is shows that this is an unsustainable society and this is the beginnings of that society crumbling because you yes. see the effects on the people in that society. Yes. Beautifully said, man. Very, very well expressed. Uh, and I, and I and when people hear about that, like the crumbling of society, that is actually the best news human beings have ever had. Because what is a society? It's not the people; it's the agreements and the structures that, uh, and in many, many, many ways, suppress people, not support them. And so that's beautiful. That's like you know, watching your handcuffs dissolve into into you know water and and fall off of your wrists that's dissolving and now you're free. So this it's, you know, the, the word apocalypse um, is, is actually not a negative or scary term. It's been sensationalized to mean something scary or to mean the end. Um, but it comes from the Greek word apocalypsos, which means the unveiling. It doesn't mean the end it means the unveiling. And that sounds pretty great to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, an unveiling means usually either something in tribute, but something new, something that we haven't seen before. So yes. exactly, that, that would be hopefully something very positive because it is new and different. And so, uh, yeah, given that term, I, I hope for the apocalypse soon. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, that's I think it's going to get quoted I think it's happening out there right that now. I hope for the apocalypse. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I, I, I will buy that T-shirt. <laughs> that's really what it comes down to you know what, what's that well I, I i think there's a great uh great selling point here you get the t-shirt that says i'm hoping for the apocalypse and on the back of the shirt you actually define what it means that's right <laughs> i love that i love that unless unless people see you coming and start running well exactly you know <laughs> um, <laughs> you just never know so uh <laughs> As, as we've gotten on all of these other topics, which still gets us into, you know, living in that better place. Yeah. But it, is there anything as we're coming up in our time that, that we didn't touch upon that you really would like to bring about or, or to talk about in, in your work, uh, you know, before we completely wrap up this fun conversation? Yeah, man. I, I uh, as, as far as the work, I mean, the work is always evolving, and I, I do the best I can to stay on the leading edge of of, uh, of the intersection between my own interests uh, and where I perceive uh, that there is need for people. So, you know, I'll, I've got you know meditations that are that are seem to be really helping people, or this uh, strange phenomenon called time piercing, which is producing some very interesting results for people. But I think the main thing. Um, you know, and, and when we when we wrap up, we'll we'll give everybody links if they want to follow. There's tons of just same as you, just lots of free content and ideas and everything. Um, but the the one philosophy, or I guess the idea that I would would say has made a huge difference in my life, and and um, I think can help people as they're navigating these exponential changes, is to really question your premise and question your sources and question authority, because. Um, you know, even even things that, that most of us, if you know, if we pride ourselves, or uh, I don't know if I pride myself, but I, I like to consider myself a fairly sharp guy. But I, I I found myself questioning all sorts of things, like you know, when Neil deGrasse Tyson, who a lot of people have a lot of respect for, and I've never met the man, so I can't say yes or no. But I do know that he espouses fairly um, conventional scientific theories, even though they're very advanced. But then you listen to a guy like um, Rupert Sheldrake who has a banned TED talk and this guy will blow your mind. Very intelligent, incredibly eloquent. And all of a sudden now you're looking at the universe a little bit differently. And so I would say that's just one example of questioning your premise, question your sources. And just because somebody sounds smart, uh, I'm not saying they're wrong, but you got to look at their premise. You know, I, I was told from the, um, the time I, I was 17 years old and I knew I wanted to open a martial arts school. And I had everybody except parents, everybody 
everybody else, including my own martial arts instructor, says, well, you should go to college first. That way you have something to fall back on. College didn't interest me. I never got my GED. Uh, I never went to school, actually. Um, but I, I just always was doing martial arts, and I, that's what I kept doing. And when I was 23, I ended up opening a school with uh, $2,000 that I had borrowed from my, my parents and grandparents. And, um, you know, six months later, I, I was profitable. And well, actually, I had to be profitable from the beginning, but I, I was able to pay that money back. And three years after that, uh, I was doing a million dollars a year and still never went back to college. Um, I just found th that other people's premise wasn't very useful. And they had never done what I wanted to do. And I became extremely respectfully, uh, but extremely skeptical of anyone who was giving me advice unless they had recently, like that week, accomplished the result that I hoped to achieve. And uh, it really helped me to find great mentors. Uh, it helped me to, to sift and sort. Um, you know, I, if I had a mentor who's get, getting great results in his business, but wasn't really uh, happy with his relationship life, then I learned to tune out when he was talking about his relationship and to tune in when he was talking about business. And so I think the, the, if I'll just leave the audience with one thing is that, you know, really just question your premise and question why you know the things that you know uh, and begin to, to ask your own questions and, and think deeply about the things that you're absorbing uh, and, and, and experiment, be more of an artist. That, that's awesome because you know, I think it's very important in what you're saying. We don't want to just become, uh, you know, these followers and, and doing what we're doing with the explanation. Well, that's just what you do or that's how we've always done it. But yeah. as you say, to question it. And, and I think that that's very important. And asking yourself that why question, as you're saying, you know, well, why am I doing this? you know, for, you know, what's the purpose and, and all that. So I, I definitely uh, agree with that and, and really think that for my focus, which is, you know, on helping people to find the inner peace, that if we take the advice you were just offering is going to lead you to more uh, inner peace because you're now incorporating what you believe. You're not just following, yeah. you're not just doing it and then yes. being frustrated, uh, yes. you know, you, you've incorporated, you've accepted it because you've answered your own questions. Love it, man. Beautiful. Yeah. And then somebody becomes self-authorized and then you stop asking for permission to be happy. <laughs> exactly. Especially from, <laughs> you know, society or governments that aren't gonna, that, that's not their job, but we seek it from them yeah. anyways. Um, Unless they can figure out a way to, to tax happiness. They'll be all over that. Oh, don't give them ideas. Um, <laughs> they'll find a way. But uh, oh, good luck. Well, that, that, that's <laughs> you know, that, that's awesome stuff, and you know, I, I encourage the listeners to, you know, really take in what we've been saying and all the examples we've been talking about, and, and the way that society is. All of this is what can lead us either toward or away from making the world a better place, finding our peace. Um. If people want to find out more about you, where, where's the best thing that they can do to learn more of you? Uh, yeah, Chris, the, the best place is uh, they just go to my website, jesseelder.com. Um, also, uh, Facebook is a great place. There's a lot of content there, a lot of videos, facebook.com uh, forward slash jesseelderlive. Uh, I also have an author page that's up. They just do a quick search on Facebook and it's uh it's there if anybody's on instagram it's uh, jesse elder live and those are those are the best places right now excellent and we'll put some of those links you know in the uh, show notes when uh, this goes live so uh, people can just click through and you know be able to find you and all that it really has been a pleasure speaking with you and uh not just because we seem to like with each other but it was a great conversation yeah, man, really enjoyed it as well. And uh, I, I think this would be a, a great dialogue worth going back and, and listening to over and over for a few people. I certainly uh, agree with that and uh, definitely encourage everyone uh, to do that. So thanks again, Jesse, and I appreciate uh, the time that you took to be with us. Likewise, Chris.
Thank you for listening to this podcast episode, and I hope that the message in this episode has inspired you and given you some of the tools that you need to find peace in your life. If you have found those tools and you found this to be inspiring and you know of others who also need these tools, please share this podcast with them. Let them know of the opportunities out there that they too can find their inner peace. Thank you very much for the sharing. Thank you for listening and have a very mindful day. listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.